This is the BearCast, presented by Bird Culchin Ford. Bird Culchin Ford has been in Waco since 1936. Ford is the number one selling truck in Texas, 43 years running. The BearCast is also presented by WellMed Medical Management and USMD Health System Dallas. Here's Craig Smoke and Grayson Grundhafer. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome into a brand new edition of the BearCast on Sikkim 365 Radio, Sikkim365.com. I'm Craig Smoke, writer, reporter, radio host for Sikkim 365, joined by director of broadcasting, also uh, team and recruiting reporter Grayson Grundhafer. And Grayson, a very busy week. Baylor's got a new baseball coach that we'll be talking about in just a moment. And they've also got some new commits. But uh, first things first, how you doing after another busy camp weekend and uh, the summer rolling on along here? Yeah, really busy camp weekend. And obviously the commits have just been kind of flowing in for Baylor. Uh, we, we talked about this before. You know, June was always a very important time for this Baylor staff. And um it was kind of known that they were going to start building out this class even more with the official visits. And man, that has just been 100% true. They are just going through and just landing commit after commit. It's been really impressive. Obviously the camps have been impressive as well. Just seeing, uh, you know, nearly, I think it was 14 offers go out from last week's camp. So they're really making up some ground there as well. Um, so it's been really intriguing. And obviously the baseball news has gotten a lot of news and notes and Austin Novosad's recruitment has gotten all kinds of coverage. So yeah, it's, it's been very busy for sure. Yeah. And we've got about, uh, well, three weeks until big 12 media days in Arlington. Uh, so that's coming right around the corner as well. Our, our big opportunity to be able to talk to and hear from Dave Aranda, as well as other coaches from around the big 12 and, uh, you know, we'll have Mac Rhodes on the show later today to talk about uh, the baseball hire, but that's where we'll start today. I mean, there's a lot of football going on, and football's right around the corner, but uh, we're going to be all over that, and we'll have plenty of, you know, the commitments and whatnot to talk about. But I think it's fair to say that the, the baseball hire was the, the biggest story from this past week and these last few days, and they did not go far. Uh, they did not go far at all to find the man to replace Steve Rodriguez, uh, a name that was mentioned early and often, a name that was mentioned quite a bit before Steve Rodriguez was even, you know, let go or decided to leave, you know, however you want to phrase that. Uh, but the ending was was coming regardless of who made the, the decision ultimately. And who was going to replace him? Well, that was going to be a national search and was, and we know that Mac Rhodes was – you know, at least talking to some people who are in Omaha, uh, to what degree and what teams and what coaches and all that, we have no idea. But, you know, he kicked the tires, and, and ultimately, uh, Omaha still has action going on, and there's still some teams remaining, and none of those teams or those coaches will be the next head coach at Baylor because the next head coach at Baylor is the most obvious choice, quite frankly, and it is Mitch Thompson from MCC Baseball uh, coming back former assistant for a long time with the Bears, and uh, he is now going to be running the program, running the show, and a dream coming true, uh, to say the least, for Mitch Thompson, who you can already tell is fired up about all this. So, um, you know, timeline-wise, I mean, Mac said they were going to be expedient, and they knew they didn't have forever, but they were going to take as long as they needed to to make the right hire. Overall, it takes them, what, a couple weeks uh, to find that guy, and shoot, the baseball season's not even over yet. So it was a really quick process in that regard. Uh, your thoughts, man. Uh, the new era seems like former players are fired up about it. And uh, overall, there seems to be a pretty positive feeling about, you know, this new uh, start, uh, so to speak, for Baylor baseball. Yeah, and this is the first time that Mac Rhodes has gone out and hired the most obvious guy. Yeah. I mean, this was the name that was leaked at the very beginning of the search. It seemed like everything was trending in that direction, and everyone wanted to come up for, you know, come up with another option or come up with, you know, someone else's name who he might hire because Mac has just had a, not necessarily an unorthodox hiring approach, but definitely he doesn't you know, go with common knowledge. He goes with who he thinks is the best candidate. And so in this situation, you get common knowledge, and then you also get a guy who Mac obviously believes in and a guy who was at Baylor for, what, 18 years as an assistant. Um, then he went to MCC, has won a lot there, two straight uh, college world series appearances, including a championship in 2021. So he's built a Juco program to the highest point it can be. And now he's coming to Baylor and I'm very curious about 
you know, kind of how that's going to transition from a JUCO coach to, you know, a D1 baseball coach at the Power 5 level. So I, I'm, you know, intrigued by it. And I think that he's a guy who obviously loves Baylor. He wanted to come back to Baylor. He's lived in Waco for a really long time. So clearly he has built, you know, roots here. And, and I think that's why the players love him so much. So I'm intrigued by it. I don't necessarily know ex what he's going to do. I don't really have a prediction for it, but I do think he's going to bring some energy to the program. And I think he's going to be a guy who can evaluate talent very, very well. Yeah, he's uh, definitely been able to, you know, put his fair share of players into the next level in D1 and, you know, certainly in the minor leagues. And uh, I know, you know, Josh Bro in the Yankee system was a big prospect just a couple years ago for the Highlanders. But, yeah, I mean, they've been uber successful. Uh, they've been, you know, in national contention pretty much every year and their conference running pretty much every year. But it is a difference going from, you know, the JUCO ranks to the, uh, to the four-year ranks. Good news is, is that he knows the lay of the land at Baylor. He knows the scholarship situation. He's not going to have to familiarize himself with how that all works. And, you know, certainly they're a school that you can look at and say could stand to benefit from the scholarship freedom that could be coming. Um, so, you know, as far as familiarity, uh, you couldn't have found much better than that. Uh, and whether that translates to wins or not, I don't know. But uh, it does seem like at least fans are fired up for the first time in a while about Baylor baseball. Uh, can't recall really the last time I've heard too much from former players. I don't, you know, frequent Baylor X baseball Twitter, and I don't even know if that exists, but you know what I'm saying? Like you just, you know, when football's doing well, you'll see tweets from guys and all that basketball, same thing, uh, baseball, a little more infrequent, but, uh, I've seen a little bit of that and, uh, that's been, that's been good. And, and to see just you know, some of that juice that we talked about that was missing for so long, it does seem like they've kind of got that. Now, obviously, he has a lot of work to do. He's got to get right to recruiting and all of those things. But I don't know. It seems like a good fit. And, you know, obvious isn't always the best. But as I said on the show the other day, uh, in this case, um, you know, it was obvious for a reason. I mean, it was just he makes sense for a lot of the reasons and, and a lot of the boxes that Mac Rose would need to check. Yeah, and I mean, when he was at Baylor, that was Baylor's best run in Baylor baseball's history. So they were very, very good during that time. And so, I mean, I'm intrigued by it. Again, I think that since he's not coming from the D1 Power 5 level, it's a little bit harder to gauge, you know, exactly how well he's going to do at Baylor. But I think culture-wise, I think he's a home run hire. And I, I think that's what Baylor really needs, honestly, for this program. Like, when we talked about it, you know, who's the perfect coach that you would want Baylor to get? I think it's someone who's going to rejuvenate the fans, rejuvenate the roster, and just overall just bring in a different culture to the program and just make ba Baylor baseball fun again, to be honest. I mean, it just hasn't been fun for a few years now, and um, so hopefully they get back to that. But I I'm happy with this hire. I, I think it's going to end up being a pretty good one, and um, I'm hopeful that he can come in and get things started because they need it quickly they've lost a lot of talent to the portal and uh, he's gonna have to figure out a way to bring in more talent bring in guys that maybe he's been able to scout or see in person and hopefully elevate um, this this team yeah uh, that's what it's all about now is the recruiting piece and you know not only have they had guys bail they had guys bail directly to big 12 schools <laughs> you know like one to TCU and one to Oklahoma and so on it's just uh kind of weird how quickly that happened I almost like, I don't know, maybe there were conversations already occurring because that happened really quick for a couple of those guys in particular. Um, but, you know, they made their decisions and now he can go pick off, you know, some of those rosters because, hey, that, that new addition is going to take up some scholarship from somebody. So, hey, go, go find a dude from OU or TCU or wherever and, you know, restock the cabinet. So that's all fair and, you know, love and recruiting right now. So, Mitch Thompson is the guy that will be leading Baylor baseball. Exciting. Uh, had a chance to talk to him on many occasions and always enjoyed our conversations about, you know, his program, but also about just the game of baseball as well. So uh, introductory press conference coming up on Thursday. Be interesting to hear just kind of the turnout and the reaction and just uh, the things that he discusses uh, with that. But uh, that's what we look forward to now. That's the kind of the next big thing for Baylor baseball and, of course, the uh, fundraising piece, he's already been quick to work on kind of trying to drum that up a little bit, which is also needed. So he knows exactly what 
like I said, the lay of the land and what needs to be done, and he's already hit the recruiting and hit the, the fundraising. So he'll do the press conference, and then it's just off to the races after that. So big hire, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But certainly a different uh, style taken by Mac Rhodes in this search. Uh, no, no surprise. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. The, the obvious choice. Uh, elsewhere in football, a couple new commits coming down, and I cannot remember – if uh, we talked about this young man or not, but did we talk about Corey Kelly last week? Was he committed? Because it was, I think it was the day of, but were we already recorded before he committed? I think we were already recorded. Okay, yeah. so let's, we need to talk about three guys then, right. I suppose. Uh, but yeah, Corey Kelly, uh, we'll start off there. Uh, as Baylor's reeled in three commits since the last time that we talked to everyone out there. And uh, they've had, uh, obviously, the last two weekends with these camps and visits and everything that goes into that. Lots of offers, as you mentioned, have been thrown out over, you know, various prospects and positions and classes. Uh, But this 2023 class now up to 14, three new additions and also a subtraction, um, who I asked you about yesterday on the radio, but we'll revisit again as we go along here. But let's start off with the addition that occurred uh, probably a few hours after we wrapped up this podcast last week. Uh, League City linebacker Corey Kelly uh, joined the Baylor 2023 class, had offers from the likes of uh, Houston and Memphis and Boston College and Indiana, kind of all scattered all over the country. Uh, But uh, big dude, I mean, as far as height and already got some pretty substantial weight on him, but uh, at six foot four, Grayson, I mean, I guess he could stand to probably gain even some more, uh, but certainly you like the profile, you like some of the offers. Do you like the pledge of Corey Kelly, this 2023 class? Yeah, so one one thing that I will mention, he measured in 6'2", 210 on his visit. So okay. that's kind of what, that's more what we're looking at with Corey Kelly. Right. So kind of in that mold of like, I mean, you're hoping he's in the mold of like a Von Miller. Right, that's kind of what you're hoping at the Jack, someone who can rush the passer, be extremely athletic off the edge, but also be able to drop in coverage some and be able to hold up uh, in Baylor's defense playing that Jack position, which is where he's going to start. I think that's where he's just going to end up for his entire career. He seems like such a perfect fit for what they want at the Jack position. Um, Caleb Collins, big in his recruitment. Obviously, Collins will be his position coach at Baylor. Um, They have a strong relationship, and... I think when you watch Corey Kelly's film, you go, okay, he had 97 tackles, 16 for loss, four sacks, 11 pass breakups. The guy kind of played all over the field, and he wasn't able to just line up as a pass rusher all the time, whereas at Baylor, he will be able to. So he shows flashes on film getting after the quarterback, but it's more so him just making plays for the defense in general, getting in the backfield, uh, making tackles, running down ball carriers. I mean, just a really good prospect and a guy that Baylor's been recruiting for a long, long time. He actually got his offer. I don't know if it was the exact same day as Austin Nova said, but it was like a day or two in between uh, the two getting their offer just to let everyone kind of gauge how long they've been recruiting Corey. It's been a really long time. So uh, this is a great pickup. He was actually, uh, he's up there as being probably my top Jack prospect that they've been really, really in on. Uh, the other one being post uh, Jack, who's committed to uh, Texas Tech, Isaiah Crawford, and then Braylon Shelby out of Friendswood. Those were kind of the top three that I had in mind. So they get Kelly. Crawford's going to be on a visit this week in an official visit. So Baylor's really bolstering that position, which is great to see. Yeah, uh, good to see that pick up, and it was, uh, I guess it would have been commit number 13 for them, but that wouldn't last very long because then Javion Wilcox, who has been committed for quite some time, Lake Belton, defensive back Lake Belton, a newer school here in the uh, Waco Temple area, uh, that is, you know, kind of the new hot spots where the big, you know, five-star wide receiver Micah Hudson goes, and you've got Wilcox, and you've got some other guys, but... Uh, JV on Wilcox just kind of, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been, you know, uh, reading tea leaves for him, uh, but all of a sudden saw him post a tweet and I'm like, well, we're just celebrating a commit. Now there's, you know, back to, to 12 or whatever it was because he decommitted. And then I guess less than a day later committed to TCU. Uh, so there was a subtraction in addition to the additions, but, uh, yeah, just I guess you touched on this on the radio, but for those that didn't listen, your your thoughts on Wilcox heading to TCU? 
Yeah, so I mean, Jay Vion, obviously a good prospect, but I don't know that he's what they need in this class. And so just kind of going back a little bit during his recruitment, he uh, committed to Baylor and then overall he hadn't scheduled an official visit with Baylor during the summer. So it was kind of weird to track that and be like, okay, so he doesn't know if he's going to take an official visit to Baylor. He's been on an official visit to TCU, you know, what's going on here. And just kind of reading the tea leaves, it seemed like maybe his commitment was not as locked in as some of the others in the class. And so he made the decision to decommit, commits to TCU. Now, as far as the Baylor side of things, uh, he just doesn't really, to me, he doesn't really fit what they need at the safety position. He looks more like a linebacker to me um, or a safety that plays really close to the line of scrimmage, like a star position guy, which they already have with Corey Huff in this class. So again, he just, I, I don't know that they really had room to take another star slash linebacker, which makes me believe that it, it just maybe wasn't the best fit for him. So I think Baylor's going to be fine. They need a field safety much more um, than a star type. And so I think they'll be able to go use his spot for someone like that now. So they went from 13 to 12 and then back to 13 as a couple of commits this past weekend coming out of uh, this uh, round of visits and, and all of that. Uh, so a pretty good run they've been on here in the month of June with five commits and commit number four of those five and five of those five we now get to as um, I forget in which order these guys uh, committed because it was pretty quickly one after the other. I guess let's start off with Bryson Washington was first. Uh, but uh, a flip here uh, for Bryson Washington, an SMU commit uh, who uh, I guess is now headed to play in the Big 12 instead. Um, you know, I didn't follow him a lot, but I did know a lot about him because of where he played, uh, where he plays his high school football nearby Franklin. Heard a lot about him there, but I got to be honest, didn't follow him much past his SMU pledge and all of that. Um, but he's uh, the newest Baylor Bear. They've got a running back, and uh, they've got a load of a running back at that. Your thoughts on this commit from Bryson Washington? Yeah, and, and Bryson's a really fun one for me just because I posted about Bryson back in 2019, and I actually reached out to him in 2019 and talked to him. I, I liked what I saw on film from him, and he, he pretty much is a guy that just does everything at Franklin, which you would expect from the best players at that level, at that 3A level. The, the best guys play both ways a lot of the time. So he was a guy that's been on my radar for a long time. He's visited Baylor a ton over the last two or three years um, and never got an offer. And it was so bizarre that he never got offered, but... The thing of it was, was Baylor was evaluating him as a safety or a linebacker, and they didn't feel like he was worth an offer at those positions. But as time has progressed, they've started to look at him more as a running back, and obviously they finally offered. I mean, I could not believe how long it took for them to offer. And right when they offer, he decides to commit to SMU after his official visit last weekend. And so it was kind of like, okay, so they offered, but is anything going to come of it? Well, he scheduled his official visit the very next weekend to Baylor, showed up on campus, and Baylor recruited him really, really hard for the running back position and really sold him on it. He wants to play running back at the next level. SMU's scholarship was for linebacker slash athlete, whereas Baylor was just telling him, you're going to be a running back here. And I personally think he's one of the best running backs in the state. Um, I know this class in the state isn't amazing. You don't have a bunch of, you know, Zach Evans or anything like that. But there are some really good ones. And I think Bryson fits squarely inside the top five, top three uh, type running backs in the state. Overall MVP in his district two straight years. Been to a state championship game two straight years. Won the title last year. Uh, six foot, 205 pounds. Over the last two years, 2,856 yards rushing and 39 touchdowns on just 215 carries. He's a freak show. He also has 239 tackles on defense. So he's done a ton on the defensive side as well. And I just, I love this pickup. I love the offer when they uh, decide to finally offer him. And I love this now that you have him as your running back in this class. And we know how important the running back position is in Baylor's wide zone scheme. And I think he's a perfect fit for it. Yeah, and just as a player, I mean, regardless of, you know, where Baylor wanted him or where others wanted him, I mean, Iowa State, TCU, Tech, uh, BC, Boston College offering a lot of Texas kids, uh, Houston, Arkansas, et cetera. So a pretty healthy offer list as well for those who, you know, get jazzed by that sort of thing. 
Um, I typically just go like, hey, the coaches want him, cool. Um, you know, on occasion you might question it if like maybe only Incarnate Word is offered a guy or something like that, but uh, he's definitely got the offer list uh, to go with the uh, the excitement of the commitment as well. So, yeah, Bryson Washington, a big pop for uh, Baylor football at the running back spot, and they weren't done there. I mean, another commitment to discuss, number 14, was then in the books is um, – they were able to add a uh, defensive lineman that uh, I was, I don't know, I just wasn't paying that much attention, and uh, Bryson Washington had dropped, and was like, okay, cool, that's some of the remnants of this weekend and whatnot, and then boom, here we go with a, another one, and that was LaGrange's Jaron Woods, uh, who is a big fella and who is uh, obviously going to be a part of them revamping this defensive line that's aging it's very talented, but it's an older group this year, to be sure. Uh, but what can you tell us about Jaron Woods, who seems to be a guy that a lot of people were paying attention to? Yeah, he took his vis- his official visit this weekend, as did Bryson, who we just talked about. But yeah, Jaron is an interesting one because I felt like he was going to take his time a little bit more than maybe some of the other prospects, which, you know, we're going to get into it a little bit more. Baylor's recruiting momentum is, is not done here. But with Jaron... I mean, he's got a great offer list. You look at Auburn, Cal, Houston, TCU, Texas, Vanderbilt, Texas Tech, Yale. I mean, this is a very solid offer list, and you kind of have offers from various places who you know evaluate talent really well. And so uh, I I felt like Jaron was going to take his time. I felt like he was going to turn into more of a national-level recruit, and instead he just found a home at Baylor. And, I mean, you turn on his film – He is so long and lanky. It is crazy, the fact that he looks so long on the outside, and he's still thick on the inside. I mean, the dude's 6'5", 278 pounds, but then you think about the fact that he's so long and rangy, he's easily going to get to 300 pounds and be an absolute force uh, for this Baylor defensive line. He fits in exactly what they want, uh, especially with that wingspan and and just a guy who – I think it's going to be a a high impact guy, but it might take him a little longer to get on the field. I I think that he's going to have to do some things in the weight room and get his body uh, to the point where he can be truly a power five level contributor. But I think once he gets there, there's a chance that he's one of the better defensive linemen uh, in the conference. Uh, I think he's got that kind of ceiling. So I love this pickup. This was a battle right here that Baylor won uh, with his kind of offer list. So yeah, huge pickup for Baylor with uh, Jaron Woods. And I mean, that that's just crazy when you talk about the kind of upside that you're getting with a guy like this on the defensive line because Texas doesn't grow 6'5", 278-pound defensive linemen who can actually play football all that often who aren't like five-star guys. So uh, since we last talked to you, Corey Kelly, Jaron Woods, and Bryson Washington all joining this 2023 class. Uh, you had the departure of JV on Wilcox, so they sit at 14 now for the class of 2023 and uh, with more activity to come this summer. So uh, how do you kind of want to handle this here? Um, I guess this will be a moment where this will either stay in the podcast or this will be uh, taken out. Uh, but do you want to refer to something? How do you want to do that? No, uh, let's just for now, let's just kind of talk about momentum that okay. they have and kind of where they're at. I, I see them. I had So there's two more commits that I feel like are going to happen relatively soon. Which is why I'm dancing here is right. because I, we don't know timing on these sorts of things. Right. So I do feel like there will be two more that don't have anything to do with their official visits that are coming up this weekend. So I'll just leave it. Let's just leave it at that. Um, and we'll talk about more of the commits next week. But I do think there's more momentum coming. I mean, they are far from done. This is, I mean, this is one of those stretches this week and next week where I think they're just going to continue to add commits. They, they I thought they were going to have five in June. I think there's a chance they get to 20 total commits in this class, uh, which would be what started at 12. So that'd be eight instead mm-hmm. of five Um, because you lost one as well. So, yeah, I think there's a chance they're able to get to 20 by the end of June, which, I mean, that's almost a full class right there. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you, okay, uh, how much room do they have? Because that's sort of where you start to get to the point of when you approach 20 is is sort of that line where you go, all right, well, you're going to be somewhere around here, but just by how much? Uh, So, as of right now, that 20 mark, they've got six remaining to get to there. Uh, So, 
I don't know. Reading the tea leaves, how do you feel about that? Yeah, let, let's do the math a little bit because I haven't done a ton of, of math on this yet. But they're full at quarterback as long as Nova said stays committed. If he doesn't, then they'll still add a quarterback. So right now it's full. Uh, running back's done. Wide receiver, I think's done. I mean, I've kind of alluded to this. Maybe they take one more, but I think right now, I think the safe bet is they're just going to stick with Micah Gifford. They're done at tight end. On the offense line, they have two commits. I think they will end up with four offensive linemen in this class, maybe five. Uh, we'll use four as the number currently. Defensive line, very interesting. They got Trent Thomas, Jaron Woods committed. I think they're for sure going to take two more, but I think it's going to end up being three more. On the, off on the defensive line. So that's five more additions right there between uh, those positions. They still have to take two cornerbacks, which gets you to seven more. And now you're up at 21, 21 commits. And so maybe one of those corners ends up being a safety. But so, yeah, I'll, I'll put my number right around. I think it might be 22 now based on how the numbers are kind of shaking up and where they need more help on the you know, adding bodies and more talent at certain positions. So how about we stick with 22 at this very moment? Okay, so let's uh, clear some things up. They've got 14 commits, got possibly a couple more on the way relatively soon. We'll see how that goes. Um, we're going to get to Novosad in just a second, but what's the calendar like now? They've had these last couple of weekends, so what are people looking at as far as news coming and – more visits and that sort of thing. Yeah, so one more official visit this weekend along with camp. So this will be their third official visit weekend in a row. Um, and this one is going to be actually might be the most intriguing one. And the reason for it is how many uncommitted prospects are going to be on this visit. And, and that's that's huge. They got two offensive linemen who aren't committed. They have uh, the Jack linebacker, Isaiah Crawford, who's committed to TCU. He'll be on the visit. Obviously, he's got ties to Baylor as well, was committed to Baylor for a while until Joey McGuire left. Tech, you said TCU, yeah. I think. Oh, I did. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Tech. So um, he's one. They got two, they got three cornerbacks on this trip as well. And I could see all three or two of the three or at least one of the three committing after the trip as well. So it's going to be loaded, jam packed heading into next weekend. And then outside of that, you know, you got Austin's decision. Which again, I I'm just struggling to believe that it's not that he hasn't made up his mind already. I, I just I'm struggling to believe that. I maybe it hasn't gone public, which it might not go public for a little bit, but um, struggling to believe that. But on the calendar, he does have the Elite Eleven Finals at the end of the month, which I'm expecting him to for sure have a public decision by then, as he's going to want to go to that event and wear, you know, you know those guys wear you know, Baylor hats or, mm -hmm. you know, have Baylor towel or Baylor gloves or whatever, Baylor shirts. Like, he's going to want to rep the school that he's going to at that Elite 11 event. So that's another thing to look out for. Outside of that, they have one more camp date in July. But, I mean, really, it's going to be a lot of uh, waiting, waiting until probably the end of the season when they probably trickle in a couple more official visitors towards the end as they kind of wait a little bit to kind of figure out where the class is at really after June, to be honest. Yeah, you got to see kind of where you stand. I mean, it could be like 27 commits to be like, what, what do we, we got? I mean, they're not going to be that yeah. far. I'd be like 14. Maybe you don't say it. be like all of a sudden at 19, you're like, wait a second. We got to yeah. slow down almost here and kind of scan the land a little bit. But yeah, this it's awesome to see the, the momentum they have and, I know you've been high on their, you know, their visits and getting these guys on campus and what that would mean. And obviously it's been impactful because you've seen a handful of guys now uh, give their pledges over the last couple of weeks uh, as this class continues to grow. But, I mean, you mentioned the quarterback situation there, Austin Novosad, who's uh, toying with, you know, offers from uh, Ohio State, an offer from Ohio State, basically, and his commitment to Baylor. Uh, he took his Ohio State visit. Uh, he's now been on his Baylor visit uh, as of last weekend. And I know that there's information here and there, but also, again, he doesn't have a an announcement that he's made just yet. So no one really knows, save him, what his future looks like. But um, just your thoughts on what you heard coming out of that, you know, that very important visit for, for Nova Sad and his decision, but also, obviously, for Baylor football and you know, their, their future at quarterback, basically, they're, cause, because they're all in on him. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just hard for me to imagine that he doesn't end up at Baylor. I've been stuck on this 8 out of 10 confidence number for a long time, to be honest. You know, when he took the official visit to Ohio State, 
that dropped me from, you know, 10 out of 10 to 8 out of 10. Um, because just getting the offer didn't matter. It was him taking an official visit, made it drop to an eight. Um, and he went on the Ohio State visit. It went really well, but it didn't go so well that he decided to decommit on the spot. And he still, you know, took his trip to Baylor. Ohio State brought in another quarterback to take on their official visit and brought Glenn. And Baylor did a great job this weekend. You know, they made it feel like home, gave him the the family vibe and everything that he's seen from Baylor throughout his recruitment, he got to see again over the weekend. And that led into him going home on Sunday, uh, you know, just trying to talk to his family, you know, Sunday and Monday and try to figure out, you know, what's the best decision here? Is it is it best for me to remain committed? Is Baylor the spot for me as it has been throughout this entire process it, or you know, is there a reason for me to switch to Ohio State? And I, I think that's kind of where he's at right now. Like, is there really a reason for him to make that decision? So far, there hasn't been, um, but we'll see. You know, he's got a little bit of time before he absolutely has to probably come to some sort of decision, but I do think it's going to be soon. Like, Baylor and Ohio State need to know what's going on, you know, because both need to figure out what the backup option is if Austin does decide uh, to, you know, go to one school or the other. So I think he's going to make that decision relatively soon. If he'll go public, who knows, but he's going to have these talks with the coaches and, and really try to, you know, figure out what's best for him. Uh, good news is I'm actually going to go out and see him today, tonight. Um, he's got seven on seven league practice. So I'm going to go out there and um, talk to him and just kind of see where his head's at. And, you know, I know he's been very honest with me throughout this entire process. And he's talked to, you know, so many reporters now because the Ohio State guys have all been talking to him a ton recently. And so I know it's been a lot for him. And that's why I think this decision really is going to come soon because I think he's kind of over it, over this Dude, I would be. Process. Like, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to go into my senior year. And I'm not saying this because, I mean, I have no influence on him anyways. I'm saying this for anybody. I wouldn't want to be dragging that out through my senior year if I didn't have to. Yeah, like if, he won't. He won't. No, I know. Yeah. I'm just I, – I, and I can see the guys that do. They want to drag it out till signing day and all of that. But I just feel like, man, it would be such a distraction to have to deal with that. I would just want to, like, be able to just – enjoy it you know and and, I, and that does sound like what he's going to want to do as well for the reasons you mentioned you want to rep at elite 11 you want to just have it out of the way you want to focus on oh i don't know your high school team um <laughs> remember there are teams that are supposed to be focused on in this right. nil era but and, yeah and let's be clear here this this is the reason that this has become such a debate there's really not a better offer that he could get than Ohio State no. with the situation that they have there as far as like playing time potentially being available somewhat early in his career uh, a coach who's also a quarterback coach who's gotten guys multiple guys to the NFL I mean since 2019 uh, they've had two top 15 picks they're about to have another one with CJ Stroud so like Ohio State is honestly the best offer he's going to get so that's why this is the biggest test for Baylor. But I would also say if he does remain committed to Baylor, it's over. It's over in my eyes. Like there, there's not another offer that in my, in my mind could tempt him uh, just depth chart wise and also just the prospects of getting to the NFL and things like that. So um, this is a big, big situation for Baylor. Baylor's got to figure out a way to close the deal here because he's obviously one of the most talented quarterback recruits they've ever gotten. Uh, probably the most talented, highest ranked since Jarrett Stidham in my eyes. Um, he's on that level. Stidham was about a top 35 national recruit. I think Austin's going to break inside the top 50 after the Elite 11. At least I think he should, which would put him right around the top six quarterbacks in the country. All right, so there we have it coming out of this uh, official visit weekend and all that comes with that, a couple new commits, big update on... Austin Novosad also, uh, of course, the big hire of Mitch Thompson as well in baseball. Uh, that's been widely discussed over the last few days. And uh, besides that, is there anything else that you want to add into the mix uh, before we get into a handful of questions here? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we pretty much have covered it all. I know there's a big official visit weekend and people you know, might want a semi-preview, but just talking about some of the guys that were there that I, I already mentioned, I, I think that suffices. Matthew Klopfenstein, the tight end commit will be there trying to recruit some guys as will Corey Huff. So those are the two commits that will be in attendance trying to recruit. And we saw how big of a deal that was, especially the second weekend where they had five commits on, on that official visit and how well it worked out for landing, you know, some of the guys on that visit. So hopefully Klopfenstein and Huff are ready 
you know, with their Baylor pitches this weekend. All right, so that's uh, where Baylor football stands. And, um, yeah, we got the summertime in full effect right now. Just watching this College World Series end here over the next few days, and uh, then that'll be all she wrote, but that'll – wrap up and we'll have uh, I don't know three weeks until Big 12 media days so a uh, very interesting time that we're in right now of uh, just a lot swirling and uh, we'll I guess close out with uh, without much to add on because we've already covered a lot as you mentioned uh, with uh, some mailbag questions this week and we'll start off with Alpha Needle uh, considering Apu Ika and Jackson Player both play nose tackle how does Roberts maximize both of their playing time? Yeah, I think you're going to see Jackson be the backup nose tackle, and the backup nose tackle plays a ton in Baylor's scheme, but I also think you'll see him at, you know, defensive tackle as well, playing, you know, replacing Gabe Hall at times. So I think he's going to get on the field a ton. They did not bring him in just to be a backup nose tackle. That is simply no. not what happened at all. And so he'll play. Yeah, he was brought in originally, and he was even told that he was going to be more of an end mm -hmm. and – Part of the reason why is Apu is your nose tackle, no doubt. But I think they saw as the spring went along, like, wow, he's pretty good. He can do a lot. And that's when it basically by the end of spring became he's going to play some nose, he's going to play some tackle, he's going to play some, he's going to just, we're going to play him. He's going to be on the field a lot. Right. Is what we're going to see with Jackson player. Yeah, he's going to play a ton. So don't get too concerned about him being the backup no. nose tackle at all. Like it might be Franklin Hall and Ika who start. But Jackson is going to be the first guy off the bench in my eyes to to get reps on the defensive line. And and what a one two punch! I mean, I, I I don't know Baylor football history as well as some others out there listening, but I can't imagine there's been too many one two punches and nose tackle like an Apu and Jackson player. I mean, no, that's, you're not you're not going to find many. That's um, one of the best units in the country on paper. They got to follow through with it. It sounds like they both had productive springs, but yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of anticipation for those guys. I mean, in the entire country, you're not going to find two. No. I mean, it is, it's impressive. And on, honestly, it's going to help these guys stay fresh and stay healthy as well by not having to play them every single snap. That that just doesn't work out at this level of football. And Baylor's done a great job with their subbing. They, they get their top six guys play a ton on the defensive line. Scotty B, the Baylor King, if Iowa State doesn't make a bowl game this season, do you think Matt Campbell will be on the hot seat for the 2023 season? For sure, and I think he might just try to get out of Dodge if if they don't make a bowl game or if they go 6-6. Six and six. I'm so, He needs to move. I, I, just, I don't think that Iowa State job is going to be very appealing a couple years from now. I will disagree slightly. I don't think they'll ever put him on the hot seat. I think he would have to have, like, a scandal going on for Iowa State to put him on the hot seat. Now, will the National College football fan put him on the hot seat? Yes, but that's an entirely different thing from Iowa State. Iowa State is under no grand illusions that they are suddenly some football powerhouse or that they were destined to be. I think they realize that they've got it pretty good with him, and it's better than it's ever been, and they're not going to rush him out of town anytime soon just because he's only winning – eight or nine games. I mean, um, they got to be realistic. So, no, I don't think he would be on the hot seat, but I think he's, you know, from the school's point of view, but I think from his own point of view, he might be going, is this all I can do here? Like, am I tapped out? Like, that's what he, he could probably start thinking. So I would think it would be more on his end that maybe that would start to sort of bring the conclusion um, – to, to a head versus anything Iowa State would do. That's just my opinion, though. Uh, what grade would you give for the Mitch Thompson hires new Baylor baseball coach? I admit for me it would be an A+. Plus. Um, I'll give it a... Uh... I'll give it an A minus. Um, it, it's more so I love what he's bringing for the culture and everything like that, but he's not... He hasn't proven it a ton as a head coach at the Power 5 level, so that's why there's a slight decrease there so an a minus for me i mean that's still a really good grade I, I really like the higher i just i don't it's not as proven as maybe it could have been yeah and you know i found this when i was doing kind of those loose off-season grades um you know for position groups you almost feel bad putting a minus even if it's an a minus and it's yeah. like this but it's not negative though it just means like a 91 right. you know versus a 95 and but the, for some reason that minus just makes it feel like it's a, a bad thing when you're saying it. But, yeah, A-minus is a great score. That's, that's going to get you a degree. It's going to get you everything that you want. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say A-minus, a uh, you know, in terms of excitement level and the uh, energy for the fan base and all of that, I think top marks. 
Uh, you couldn't have picked anybody to, to more rally. I think the hardcore Baylor baseball fan and alum, uh, that was the number one choice you could have made. Uh, I'm certain that there's probably a segment that, you know, wishes they would have been like Troy Tulowitzki because he's a hot name or whatever. Uh, he's going to apparently interview for the USC job. I saw that a little while ago. But, you know, I mean, as Mac Rhodes said, it's Baylor baseball. It's not just any baseball job, and there's some unique parts to it that's not going to be appealing to everybody uh, or that's not going to be a fit for everybody. And I think Mitch Thompson checks all the boxes, and, and there wasn't going to be a ton of candidates out there that did that. And just his inner knowledge of – success here previously and how that happened and how that worked and his role in it and what he's learned since then and just his familiarity and his connections I just I don't think you could have gotten anybody in here who would have been a better more familiar name than than Mitch Thompson so for that reason I'll give it an A minus A flat whatever uh but yeah you know you know, it's it's we got to see him go out there and do it, obviously as well. Because there are a lot of people that weren't high, and certain hires that have been made that have turned into the greatest hires ever, Dave Aranda, or Matt yeah. And then there's been others that they'll never, you know, and they turn out they turn out to be great. And there's others that you think are going to be home runs, and they turn out to be singles. So we'll Rule, see. Rule was the I, I know people had questions about Aranda, but Rule was the one where oh he's the one everybody's like what? what yeah, and everyone hated him because he was right after Bryles, and we're like yes. oh he'll never be Bryles and all this. And he's and, from Jersey, even right. though he wasn't from Jersey, which yeah. is a weird weird thing that people obsessed <laughs> over. Like a couple people obsessed over for oh, yeah. a while. Um, all right, uh, just a bear in frog world. Um, how much does a player's performance at one of these camps play into them getting an offer, or do the coaches already have a pretty good idea of who they want to offer going in? I'd say, um, especially with the guys that used to be here, camps are a big thing with James and um, and uh, Brian, you know, Nance, yeah. uh, Nance that they were big camp guys, but Rule's a big camp guy. I mean, I think like the whole uh, staff now are camp guys. I think just in general, college football are camp guys, you know, like that's, that's where you're going to find some of your diamonds in the rough. Yeah. But it is a mixture because the the kids don't, most of the kids who get an offer don't just show up at camp by coincidence. Right. They're off. Yeah. They, they're, they are wanted to come to a camp. The staff reaches out and is like, Hey, we want you to come to camp. Here's a camp invite. We want you here because they want to see the prospects, see the testing time, see how they perform on the field. So, I would say the coaches have an idea of who they're going to offer. And then I think there's these other guys who maybe they're like, uh, he's not very fast on film. Let's get him on campus. And then he runs and you're like, oh, oh, wait a minute. Okay. He's, he runs a four, four. Okay. Yeah. He's an offer now. So I think it's kind of a mixture, but I do feel like more times than not, the coaches have an idea of the guys that they might offer at the camp. And guys might look smaller on film than in person. You see him in person. You're all of a sudden like, wait a second. He's not as small as I thought he was. Or, or vice versa. Or <laughs> vice versa. He looks huge on tape, and then he's small. So, yeah, it's it's a mixture of things. But there are definitely more than a few guys who, I mean, yeah, I'm sure there was an idea that they could maybe be an offer. But they go out there, they do their thing, and they earn an offer. And that's a that's a big deal. That's a big deal in a player's life is to, to earn those offers. So, camps are are pretty important, um, but they're not the end-all, be-all, like you said. Uh, all right. Uh, secondly, are Baylor fans setting their expectations too high this year given the football team's road schedule? So, actually, this conversation, I know that Travis in particular has been very, very positive on this upcoming year. I, th I think we should also ask Bear Sack's question because it's like the exact. It's, okay. It's, very, it's just very similar. Okay. Very similar. Uh, Bear Sack, uh, we lost some good players to the NFL draft, yet Sick uh, yeah, 365 is bullish. I wouldn't say everybody, as we'll get to in a moment. Is bullish on a possible better upcoming season. Are we drinking Kool-Aid a bit, or are the odds makers just really devaluing our chances to win the Big 12 again this fall? So, um, both, yeah, like you're right, both those questions are in line. So, actually, yesterday I was reading something that Travis had written, and I was just sitting there thinking, like, man, he has been just really positive about this upcoming year. I mean, like, I, I don't – Sunshine Pumper has a negative connotation, so I don't want to – but, you know, kind of Sunshine Pumping in a way, like, hey, they're going to be even better next year. And he's not – you know, there's been others who, who have said similar and whatnot. But um, I did go – I don't know, man. Like, I think they're going to be pretty good next year. And Jack and all of them were listening to me. I was like, but this and this and this and this, like they had full health last year. They had 
uh, a bunch of senior leaders that were like fourth and fifth year and sixth year guys. Um, they the had schedule. the schedule. The schedule flipped. was yeah. was incredibly favorable for them. I mean, like there's just one thing after another that kind of they won every single close game practically, and like they won a bunch of close games when you really look at it. And I could go on and on, but Jack said you might want to write something about that. I'm just figuring out how to do it where it's not um, like I. Travis is an idiot, because you know, like, I don't mean it that way, but I'm way more hesitant. And for those reasons I mentioned, and for other reasons as well, we've seen Blake Shapin for all of, like, three games. I mean, I get why we're supposed to be excited about him, but again, it's still three games that we saw him play. Uh, so, I'll save any other mentions that I have or reasons to, to not be as high for a potential article that I could write. Um, but what about on your end? Is, is there a little bit too much positivity? Is, um, you know, Sikkim 365 being bullish or the odds makers devaluing the chances? I mean, how do you how do you kind of see, um, you know, where these are coming from? Yeah, so I think there's two things that I would say. I, I would say that there's a chance they're better than last year, yet their record might not reflect that. True, which yeah. I, which I think is, is a big... Um, Thing to think about. I caveat. Mean, yeah, yeah, I would say they went twelve and two last year. I mean, oh my god, that, that's it's the greatest Baylor football team right. ever. Right. So this team could end up going, you know, eleven and three or ten and three and still being awesome. But I just I see more speed bumps on this schedule than I saw a year ago. Like your second game of the year, you're having to go to Provo, Utah, and play BYU. Like that is not going to be a cakewalk, <laughs> right? And if you lose that game, then you're probably going nine and three. You know, and, and it's a very losable game. And so I also look, you know, you got at West Virginia on a Thursday. Has Baylor ever won at West Virginia? I think people are just like, oh, West Virginia is not good. Baylor's easily going to win that game. And it's like, I can't remember Baylor winning in West Virginia since they've been in the Big 12. I don't think they have. I feel like they have, but I don't know off so, the top of my head. So yeah. 12, they got routed. Or no, 12 was the 70-63. 14, Petty broke his back, and that ruined their season. 16-ish, uh, uh, Zamora had the touchdown, but they still lost that game with Zach Smith at quarterback. 2018, the year they went 7-6 and six was when McClendon played the— I mean, they got trounced in 2018. 2020, they lost the game. JT Woods had all those interceptions, and they forced all those turnovers and lost. I don't think they've won. Well, yeah, they've only I, played 10 times. Um, yeah, Baylor won last year. I, no, I don't think they have won. In, on the road. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying yeah. I don't think they have won in West Virginia. But, I mean, that's one of those things where I used to be able to know, like, yeah— because, I mean, looking at Aranda, he's got a couple teams that he has. Or, no, I guess TCU's the only team that he hasn't beaten in the Big 12. So, I've been eyeing that. Um, but, yeah, you used to be able to spout off, like, the Oklahoma. They never won in Norman. And, but I, I, yeah, I hadn't thought about West Virginia. But uh, West Virginia, 6-4. and four, And they won, what is it, three games in a row from 2016 to 2018. And Baylor's four wins were 2013 in Waco, 2015 in Waco, 2019 in Waco, and last year in Waco. Waco. Yeah. So they've never won on the road, and it's a Thursday night game. That is, it's going to be a crazy environment. That's not going to be an easy win. Tech, hopefully that's not a night game. You're praying that that is not a night game uh, late in October, and then you go to Oklahoma and to Texas. I mean, it is a daunting Texas schedule. Texas on Black Friday. Right. It, it's a daunting schedule. So I understand the road concerns. I do believe this team is, like, quality-wise, if you were just to say, throw this team on paper, how many games should they win? I would probably say they should win 10, 10 games. I really believe that. I think the talent on their, on their roster says, okay, this is a 10-win team. And then it's just about the close games. Which way do those close games go? Um, so I think right now I'd probably project them to go something like 10-2 and two or 9-3. and three. Um, And I don't know if I can convince myself that they're going to go 11-1. and one. This, this schedule's tough. So I'm kind of on the fence right now, I would say. If they get the 10 wins, I would be over the moon for this team. I mean, I, I know that that might be, you know, not quite what people – expect or whatever but I, th I think hitting the 10 win mark any year is a big deal like if you can just consistently hit 10 then you're going to ultimately win a bunch of trophies and things like that uh, but yeah coming off of last year and how close a lot of those games were and how fortunate they were I mean just their health piece I mean you think about it for the most part they stayed pretty dadgum healthy um, you know there were bumps in the road but like remember Terrell Bernard went down early and then he was back like two games later. It was like, whew. But you thought you had lost him for the year, like in 
early on. And and there's times where Petrie was slow to get up. You're like, oh my god, but he was always back out there. And they was always guys had had guys back out there. Uh, so yeah, I mean they were they were fortunate in a lot of different ways, and you just can't guarantee that. So yeah, if they were to win ten games, um, they could have a season as enjoyable in probably some ways. But um, you know, twelve and two is twelve and yeah. two. I mean that's. Yeah, That's tough. I mean, if they go 10 and 2, they could still be in the Big 12 championship. Sure. I think that would probably get them there still. So, one thing I would also say, as long as they're healthy, I do think betting the 8-8 eight, eight is the uh the Vegas line right now for yeah. Baylor. I actually think 8 and 4 is their floor. I don't see them being worse than 8 and 4 <laughs> as long as they're not hurt, right? right. As long as the yeah. whole team doesn't get hurt, I don't see them losing more than 4 games on this schedule. Like okay, like BYU, Iowa State, o- Oklahoma State, West Virginia. Maybe they'll lose two of those, you could maybe argue. And then at the end of the year, Tech, Oklahoma, Texas, maybe they could lose two of those. But I don't see them being any worse than 8-4 and four next year, and that's why I'm kind of saying 9-3, and 10-2 and two is kind of where I'm at right now. It's an expectation. I think uh, any worse than 8-4, that would be a massive, massive disappointment yeah. with the team you got coming back. And that would have to have to be because of injuries or things of, of just unforeseen, you know, circumstances to, to go to an 8 and anything other than an 8-4. and four. An 8-4, and four, you can justify having a really good team and just having a tough schedule. But you start dipping into, like, barely making a bowl game, that would just be an – awful follow-up to last year with all that you had coming back so yeah um bear sack and uh uh just a bear and frog world I- i'm with you like on the whole the getting a little amped up for this year like i think this is going to be a really good team but but following up the road that they had last year is going to be awfully difficult even if somehow the team is better on paper and on the field uh, just getting those same results and that same bit of fortune here and there just it's improbable that that's going to happen two years in a row for you. But it'd be awesome if it did. I mean, this this team definitely could, you know, run the damn table, and they could also lose four or five games if, you know, certain things go a certain way. That's what's going to be fun is the anticipation over this next, uh, you know, stretch a few weeks and then just finally getting into these games, man. We've been talking about so much other stuff. Like, I'm just – I said this on the show yesterday, just ready to see these teams play. Like, I'm tired of everybody's sunshine pumping. Everybody's better than they were last year. All right, now I want to see it. Like, no, no, okay, West Virginia, does JT Daniels really make that much of a difference for you? He probably should, but does he? Does Quinn Ewers become, like, the first four-time Heisman winner after all of this talk we've heard about him? You know, Bijan. You know, like there's so many. Does, is Oklahoma gonna? Is remain Oklahoma an gonna? Powerhouse? Yeah, like, like does Levy just come in and it's just like he was still at Baylor years ago? I mean, there's so many questions and so many things that people are excited about because it's new or it's a change or it's whatever. And it's like, not all these coaching hires are gonna work. No, not all of these transfers are gonna be great. So that's what I'm fascinated by is you know the actual real deal. I, I am too. I, I 100% am. I, I've seen people mention the Big 12 without mentioning Oklahoma State, which is hilarious to me because Oklahoma State's going to be really good again. I, uh, I, everybody's just dismissed Iowa State. Like, they're nothing yeah, now Iowa all of a sudden. I mean, and then it's hilarious. Like, is Kansas State getting Colin Klein reincarnated, or are they just going to get a guy who has gonna, been very mediocre his entire college career? He's going like, to cost them four losses by right. throwing a pick at the end of the game or fumbling right. like he did in Nebraska. And yeah. people are counting on that guy to be potentially the best quarterback in the Big 12? But athletically, he could be in a very simple offense like that with Deuce Vaughn. He could be, yeah. He could be until he tries to hand the ball off to Deuce Vaughn and fumbles the ball and it's returned for a touchdown. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is the same guy who he's been this his entire career and he's doing the same thing. Yeah, so there's all those questions. And uh, that's what's fun about the offseason. But we are kind of at the point now where it's like, all right, now I want to see it. That's where I am right now. So we're getting close and, uh, and that's a very valid question to be asking because it's just funny. I was saying the same exact thing yesterday. Of like, man, there's almost a little too much sunshine going on right now, but uh, we will see how it works out. Moats Arc will close us out here. What's the latest on prospective hires and notable names for Mitch Thompson's staff? Uh, I don't have anything in that regard. Mitch Thompson will be, again, introduced, was it on Thursday, guys, uh, the press conference, and uh, we'll, I'm sure, learn a lot more then. Um, but I don't know anything about prospective hires or anything like that right at this moment. Yeah, I'd, I don't know anything about any of the hires that he might make. I'm sure he'll probably bring over a guy or two from MCC, I would think. I would think so, yeah. But, 
you know, we'll see. I, I think he's going to build a very nice staff regardless, and hopefully he gets a little better injury luck than Steve Rodriguez did over <laughs> yeah. the years at Baylor. Yeah, I mean, that didn't that didn't help matters at all, but um, it's it's fun to see uh, how fired up Mitch Thompson was. I mean, you, could, you know, some people say a dream job, but you can tell this really is a dream job for him and something he's thought about for a long time. I don't know if people got to hear former Baylor head coach Steve Smith, who I know has his fans, has his detractors too, but – uh, he went pretty personal and in deep on, uh, you know, the hire of Mitch Thompson and their past and their friction and their love for one another and all that. And uh, it was a really, I thought, eye-opening sort of uh, interview with uh, Steve Smith last week on Sikkim 365 Radio. So check that out if you're a Baylor baseball fan and haven't already. And, uh, yeah, I look forward now to, to hearing from Coach uh, and, and hearing what he has to say on Thursday and get him on Sikkim 365 Radio and, you know, being able to, to talk to him, it just it doesn't be weird. All the times I talked to him as MCC coach, and now he's the Baylor head coach. It's just kind of crazy how how life happens. But um, very excited to see what the future holds. So, Moats, I'd love to have an answer for you, but I think we'll learn more about that in uh, the coming days. So, hope to have an answer for you sooner rather than later. But do appreciate the question and appreciate everybody else's questions as well. Uh, obviously, very busy week. Couple new commits. Um, new baseball coach, and now that new baseball coach has got to be introduced and make some hires. And we've got uh, what women's basketball has got their camps that were going on. You've got uh, men's basketball that's just got the momentum building towards next season. Football, obviously, there's some excitement. People just don't know how excited to get. Um, and there's a lot going on as always. So stay tuned to Sikkim 365 Radio on Sikkim365.com uh, to keep on the pulse of all that's going on with Baylor Athletics with a sprinkling of Big 12 and National as well in our conversations. But we do appreciate everybody for listening as always. Thank you to to the folks uh, behind the scenes as well, Jack McKenzie and Garrett Ross for helping run the show. And uh, Grayson, anything before we go? No, I, I think that's pretty much it, of course. Be sure to check out the premium site if you want all the recruiting, football, basketball. We have coverage on pretty much everything on Sikkim365.com Premium. And then, of course, 365 Sports Radio, Monday through Friday, 3 to 6, every single day during the week. So be sure to check out that as well. Tons of really good guests and news and notes going on on the show. Yeah, and we've got a little bit of a break that we've had the last couple of weeks with the studio getting kind of redone a little bit or just taking some vacation because this is the best time to do it. But uh, we're pretty much, I think there might be a day here or there, but from here on out, I mean, we're pretty much counting down to football season and the grind. And, and again, as I mentioned, about three weeks from now, we'll have Big 12 Media Day. So starting to rev up the engines, although I don't think the engines really ever stopped all that much to begin with because it has been a very busy news cycle, but we love that. So... Love you as well for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks to Garrett, Jack, Grayson. I'm Craig Smoke. This has been the Bearcast on Sick and 365.